Are you looking for an internet talk radio station for your podcast? Look no further. At the helm of Passionate World Talk Radio are two women that want to provide a spot for you and your podcast to be heard. There are many other places for your podcast, but PWTR has the audience. You will not be disappointed. Our station has been on the internet for the past 16 years. Call us for more information. 484-364-1032. Or text Jeannie White, station manager at T-H-E-C-O-N-N-E-C-T-S-H-O-W at gmail.com for a podcast show details. Welcome to Passionate World Talk Radio. Educate, enlighten, entertain. Hello, this is Betsy Wurzel, your host at Chatting with Betsy on Passionate World Talk Radio, where our mantra is to educate, enlighten, and entertain. Folks, I have a special guest with me today, and I'm so happy that I met Marjorie Streeb, and I want to thank Luann Caldwell, who's CEO, for sending me the press release. Marjorie Streeb is author of a book, A Biography of a Child with, the, with Williams Syndrome, Another Day, Another Challenge. This month, May, is officially Williams Syndrome Awareness Month. And one in every 25,000 babies has Williams Syndrome. And I'm so glad I get a chance to talk to people and tell, for them to tell their stories. Because, folks, if you don't know what it's like to have a special needs child and to be an advocate for them, you have no idea until you walk in our shoes. I can very much relate to our guest because I have a special needs adult child. And I'm so glad I met Marjorie Streep. She is also an Air Force veteran. So salute to you, Marjorie. Thank you for coming on Chatting with Betsy. Thank you for inviting me. You are welcome. And I always ask uh, all the authors that come on as to what motivated you to write your book. Well, Michelle... I didn't start writing the book until Michelle was about 12. And I had so many entertaining stories about her and challenges and things I'd gone through with her that when I was telling friends and family and when I was telling them about about it, I used to always end every story with, oh, my goodness, I have enough to fill a book. And one day it hit me, you know, I do have enough to write a book. I need to write a book, not just talk about writing a book. And so I actually didn't start writing Michelle's biography till she was about 12 years old. And some of the things that I'd gone through at that time felt like they were indelibly stamped in my mind. So when you read the book, you'll discover she started writing it when Michelle was 12, and yet she writes these things in such detail when Michelle was a baby, you know, and and very little small. But that's that's why. I just had so many situations, and I was so busy I didn't have time to really journal it. And so, but that's that's what prompted me to start writing that book. I'm so glad that you wrote the book about your daughter, Marjorie. And I want you to explain to the audience what Williams Sy- Syndrome is, because I'm sure uh, people don't know. Uh, I know about it because they thought my son might have Williams Syndrome, but he, he doesn't. Um, so if you could please tell the audience, about Williams Syndrome? Well, uh, Williams Syndrome is a genetic disorder. 
And uh, from what I understand, from what I've been told in the research and stuff, there is about 26 genes on chromosome number 7 that's missing. How the children are born with missing genes, they're still trying to figure that out. And so that's what Williams syndrome is in a nutshell. They, they say it's genetic. Uh, it drives me crazy when people call it Williams disease. It's not a disease. You can't catch it. It's a genetic disorder. So uh, it manifests itself through, um, through d different functions, different things. One of them is uh, um, it manifests itself through developmental delays. It manifests itself through um, through retardation, or I know people don't like that term, but you know through through uh, mental handicaps, uh, and so also children with Williams syndrome very often are born with heart problems. A lot of babies are rushed into surgery not very long after birth. And those that aren't generally have surgery their first year, their first couple of years. Michelle was very blessed in that she did not have that particular, um, those particular medical challenges. Uh, she was given a clean bill of health by a cardiologist when she was eight years old. And then later, when she was a teenager, they discovered, ah, adults with Williams syndrome can develop the heart problems they weren't born with. They can develop them into adulthood. Because at the time Michelle was diagnosed, Williams syndrome had only been on the medical radar for about 24, 25 years. It was discovered in the 1960s, the early 60s. And Michelle was born in 1984. And what happened was uh, the doctors, when these children would, seemingly healthy children would suddenly die, they would autopsy the children and they would find out that they all had very similar characteristics, which was maybe they had very small blood vessels leading to their heart. And so what would happen is when, as they grew, the blood vessels weren't growing like they were supposed to. And they would die of heart attacks. And very few children with Williams syndrome actually made it to adulthood because they would die. And so back then in the 60s, they passed a law that said, if we don't know why a child died, you're going to do an autopsy and find out why. So when they were autopsying the children, they were discovering a, very, a lot of similarities in the child. This child died of this, this child died of the same thing. And so... And so they named it Williams Syndrome because the, one of the doctors who was doing the autopsies who recognized all the same characteristics and symptoms, his name was Dr. Williams. So that's where it got its name. Wow, thank you. And don't they have uh, children with Williams Syndrome have facial characteristics? Do they have a, the flat nose? And uh, yeah. what, yes. uh, they, I'm they, thinking talk some more about their facial they, and they, their characteristics. Go ahead. Well, the, some of the characteristics of Williams syndrome, I know I got off on the heart issues, didn't I? That's okay. Which, no, that's great. That's okay. And, we need to know. Yeah, which is, and Michelle doesn't even have those heart issues. But some of the other characteristics of Williams syndrome is their facial features. It's like you see a child with Down syndrome, you know that child has Down syndrome because they look like their brothers and sisters. They look like they're... All their facial features are similar, and the um, the Williams syndrome, uh, and they called it uh, 
I think like the elephant Pixin syndrome for a little while because the children with Williams syndrome all look like little fairies. They all have that cute little facial features. And so, yes, and they're, they're, um, the characteristics in their facial features are all very similar. They're very, very friendly. Um, being military, I, because I was military, my husband was military, we traveled around. Um, Michelle was born in Georgia. My family lives in California. Floyd's family lives in Wisconsin or, or, um, um, North Dakota, uh, Colorado, because his brothers were military. When we got together, with the family, Michelle just, it didn't matter they were total strangers to her because Michelle never knew a stranger. When your family's military and they're scattered all over the world or all over the states and you're getting together, it's such a blessing that she'll run up to your brother that she's never met and give him a hug. But it's so frightening in today's world, in today's society, because you go to the grocery store and you turn around and your child is gone. It's like, oh, my gosh, you have heart failure. You have a panic attack because they are so friendly. They know no stranger. And that is a characteristic of Williams syndrome. They're very friendly. They They'll hug anybody. That's kind of a sweet in, in a way, and yet it's also dangerous in today's uh, society. Unfortunately, uh, people can take advantage of a child uh, who's very you know outgoing and and friendly. Marjorie, I want you to uh, tell the audience because I know you experienced this from when I talked to you the other day. Did did you have difficulty in getting a pediatrician to believe you that something wasn't right with Michelle? Or did the pediatrician already know that? You know, the the doctors didn't know that. And um because the first baby in my life I ever took care of was my son, Michelle's big brother. So I had, by the time Michelle came along, she was number three. I had a good, I had a good foundation on taking care of a baby. I had a good understanding of milestones. You know that by the time they're six months old, they they start to sit up, they start to crawl. I I had a good understanding of that because because Michelle was baby number three. My son was just a touch delayed, as in he didn't start to walk until like 15 months. His younger sister, Jamie, she was a, a go-getter. She was on her feet running around by 10 months. And here was Michelle. By the time she was a year old, she was just starting to crawl just starting to sit up without falling over. And I, you know, when the, her first year, I didn't worry about her development too much because I know that babies develop at their own rate. But when I would take her to the doctor, concerned that she wouldn't even stand up, you know, you know how mothers do. They'll stand up their child. That your arm will be around them. You'll give them the support they need, and that's what I did. And Michelle would. She was at this point like fourteen, fifteen months old, and she would just scream in panic. And so I took her to the doctor for it and said, you know, the, her fear is abnormal. And the doctor just brushed it off and said, oh, babies walk at their own rate. I wasn't talking about her walking. I was talking about her fear. 
And so, but, you know, I couldn't get her to eat. Oh, my gosh. Her diet was was a challenge all by itself because I couldn't get her to eat anything. And so the, her pediatrician told me, you know what, she'll be fine. Just, um, just feed her what the family eats. At this time, Michelle was like 14 months old. She had teeth. She didn't have a problem with choking or gagging on things. Um, and so it wasn't like there was a physical reason she wouldn't eat. I just couldn't get her to eat. And the doctor said, ah, it's okay. Just feed her what the family eats. And if you're making, for example, if you're making Toby and Jamie grilled cheese sandwiches for the day, for lunch, a 14-month-old baby should be able to eat grilled cheese. Just give her grilled cheese with them. Don't make her special peanut butter and jelly just for her, which, by the way, peanut butter and jelly is the preferred food for for children with Williams syndrome and when I found that out Michelle ate peanut butter and jelly sandwiches for breakfast lunch and dinner nothing else and so uh, I took her to the doctor concerned that she wasn't eating and so the doctor he just said, ah, just, if you're having grilled cheese, give her grilled cheese. If you're having, you know, if you're making spaghetti that night, cut hers up, she can eat spaghetti. She wouldn't eat anything. And the doctor then set up a follow-up appointment with a nutrition specialist a month later. So uh, I followed the doctor's orders. And given Michelle what the family ate, if I was making t- peanut butter and jelly for lunch that day, I gave it to her, and she ate it. But if we weren't having peanut butter and jelly for lunch or dinner or breakfast, which most families don't, she would need it. Consequently, consequently um, Michelle lost weight, and she didn't have any weight to lose at at a year old, she only weighed 15 pounds. So, and that was because I had troubles getting her to eat. So when she went in for her for her appointment with the um, with the doctor, now I do want to tell you this, and that is because I couldn't get Michelle to eat all day. I did not let that baby go to bed hungry. Against doctor's orders, I fed her before she went to bed. I gave her a bowl of baby cereal, sweetened with sugar, because that was the only way she'd eat it. Um, A big bowl of baby cereal. Sometimes, first thing in the morning, I'd give her baby cereal, and late at night, I'd give her baby cereal. But then all day, she would not eat anything. And as a result, she lost weight. So when we went into the nutrition specialist and saw the specialist, oh, my gosh, that doctor came unglued because our child, our petite little baby, had already lost weight, and she didn't have any weight to lose. And he said, he set us up for another appointment and said, you get weight on that baby by her next appointment, or I will turn you in for child neglect. So here we are following doctor's orders and there and the the special the so-called specialist is turning this in for child neglect now when we left this was in greece because we were military we were at saw her the base at greece when we left greece we were hand carrying her medical records to the next base that was in the olden days when they did that now they don't do that now they just send them on ahead or maybe it's on the computer i'm not sure but back in those days it was a it was a hard copy and they gave us her medical records to hand to her new base was in oklahoma and and i was reading her records and i saw a notation in there that said parents obviously need counseling in pediatric nutrition. And I I read that to Floyd. I said, can you believe this? They think we're the problem. Well, on our way to our new base, we detoured to Aviano, Italy, and we were there for about a week. And I was at the point where I was getting paranoid. If Michelle even looked like she didn't feel well, 
I took her to the doctor. And at this point, she was like 15, 16 months old. And while we were in Italy, I, she got that luck. And I packed her up, and we went to the base uh, doctor to get her, and I made an appointment. And I was so upset because that doctor, we waited an hour past her appointment time. Well, when the, the, when they finally called us, I realized why we waited so long, because here was a doctor that actually cared about his patients, and he sat in his office for quite a while reading her records, which, as I said, we were hand-carrying to our new base in Oklahoma, um, and he had ans he had questions. That's right. Michelle was 20 months old at that time. She wasn't walking. She wasn't talking. She I couldn't get her to eat. He had questions. He was ready to put her in the hospital that day and run tests and find out what was wrong. And we should let him do it. We said, oh, we're, we're, we're in the middle of a PCS move, which is permanent change of station, and we don't have the time. He said, well, as soon as you get settled at your new base, you get that baby into the doctor. You find out why. And so we did. The minute, because that, that fueled my resolve at last. One doctor agreed with me that there's something wrong. I need to pursue it. So when we got to our new base at Alta's Air Force Base in Oklahoma, um, I, took, I promptly took Michelle to the doctor. And the doctor said, this baby looks good. She was 20 months old. This baby looks good. Um, and he, she said, you can go. And I said, wait a minute. Uh, have you, we've been here for 20 minutes. Have you not even noticed that during that 20 minutes, a child four months short of her second birthday did not even sit up? She did nothing but roll on the floor? And the doctor said, no, I hadn't noticed. And she walked out of the room. And so, you know, and so I, I did something, which I learned this technique in Greece. The Greeks do this. <laughs> and my husband did it once. And it embarrassed the fire out of me. And I thought, I'm going to do it because I need to do something. So when I got out to the waiting room, I stomped my foot. I pounded on the desk. I felt like a complete idiot, I'll tell you. And I started <laughs> yelling. I did. I said, what's wrong with you people? This is the most inept place I've ever been. That, uh, that this child can't walk, can't talk, and you don't care. And, you know, and... And, of course, then they whisked me into the back and said, Mrs. Chief, come on, come on, because <laughs> they didn't want all their other patients hearing how inept they were, <laughs> you know. But that started our search for answers because at last one doctor agreed with me something wasn't right. And although Michelle, she saw her first cardiologist when she was three months because she was born with a heart murmur. And uh, the doctor said, oh, she'll outgrow it. It was because she was so small at birth. And Michelle was small. She, they, they diagnosed her with failure to thrive. That is one of the characteristics of Williams syndrome is the failure to thrive. And Michelle, even Michelle was in the womb, you know, was under, was small. So she was full term when she was born. I gained a healthy 28 pounds with her. And, um, and she was four pounds, six ounces at birth. And Did so you go to I a neurologist, figured out, Marjorie? Oh, sorry. Uh, um, no, uh, you mean as far as her failure to thrive? Yeah, I was wondering if you went to a neurologist to get Michelle evaluated, if any pediatrician recommended a neurologist. She went to a neurologist 
when she was much, much later, but not to get her evaluated. You mean how did she get diagnosed with Williams syndrome? Yes. I mean, because she had um, to thrive and she wasn't doing the developmental milestones, you would think a pediatrician would say, Marge, I think you should take your daughter to a neurologist to get no, you know, evaluated. No, believe it or not, they, they didn't. They made our search as as difficult as possible. That pediatrician in um, in Oklahoma uh, sent us downtown Lawton to get a CAT scan to see if there was something with the brain. And so we went down there, and the results showed nothing. So then they sent us to uh, Texas to... Um, um, I don't remember that big medical center in Texas, the one that the president goes to when he's got medical problems. But anyway, they sent us down there. It was an eight-hour drive one way for us to get there. We got there the night before her appointment that they supposedly had made. And then when we got in there, they said, you don't have an appointment. We drove oh eight God. hours one way for an appointment that they the and the the hospital the clinic where we where we were stationed was saying you've got an appointment here's the day here's the time here's where you go don't miss it. So um, we said okay we won't. We got there we didn't have an appointment. They said oh my. Gosh, and apparently it wasn't the first time they had done that because they told us, oh, yeah, you would not believe how many times Altus has sent patients here and told the patient they had an appointment and they didn't have an appointment. So they stayed till the end of the day and saw Michelle after all their other scheduled patients shot up by the clock. Anyways, so she wasn't diagnosed there. At that base, Floyd retired from the Air Force. <clears throat> and when he got out of the military, we drove to uh, Cincinnati, Ohio, which is we still live in the Cincinnati area because he got, he landed a job with GE. And I met a wonderful lady who said to me, Marge, there's help out there. Do you mind if I help you find it? And I said, no, I just don't know where to look. So she contacted uh, Butler County Developmental Disability Services, and they called me. Now, at that time, we lived in Hamilton County. So when the lady found out we lived in the neighboring county, she said, oh, well, let me hook you up with them. So then they sent somebody out to the house to evaluate Michelle uh, from their services. And at that time, Michelle was about two and a half years old, three years old. And so they came out to the house to evaluate Michelle. And uh, she, she, they called me up. Um, they called me up like a week later with the results. And she said, Mrs. Tree, I'm so sorry to tell you this, but your child is mentally retarded. I'm like, no, she's not. I don't believe it. And the thing that confused me about it was that Michelle, uh, because Michelle has Williams syndrome, one of the characteristics of Williams syndrome is they're so smart in certain areas. They're avid readers. Of course, at that age, Michelle wasn't reading. But, I mean, I watched her. That girl, could she could use electronics. She knew how to use the TV remote at three years old. I'm like, I couldn't envision that mentally handicapped child doing those things. So they said, we're sorry, she is, but we can get you into some home services. So then they got us into home services. Then the lady that came out once a week to work with Michelle, and she told me about um, um, an agency in the Cincinnati Children's Hospital called 
Cincinnati Center for Developmental Disorders. She said they can they can evaluate Michelle and and probably give you a diagnosis, but to get her in, you have to have a referral from her pediatrician. Now, because we were no longer in the military system, Michelle had a um, a pediatrician that was off base. Uh, um, so I went to him and asked him for a referral to get Michelle into CCDD, the Cincinnati Center for Developmental Disorders. So he wrote that referral and got her into that system and got her referred. Man, they took one look at Michelle and knew she had Williams Syndrome because of the facial features. And they ran tests after test, after test, after test. And these were not like the military test, 10 minutes and you're done. These tests lasted anywhere from an hour to three hours. And they, because of Michelle's age, they were all in game form. And that's where she got the official diagnosis of Williams syndrome was at the Cincinnati Center for Developmental Disorders. And I found out later that one of those that that that's only one of eight centers throughout the United States was in my home state, was in Cincinnati at that time. And that was such a blessing because looking back, I know God took us there for a reason. So but and anyway how old was Michelle I, at that time? She was three and a half when she was diagnosed. And today, I talked to a lady one time that said she was three years old. That lady's baby got diagnosed at six months. She said, oh, my gosh, what's wrong with you that you didn't get her diagnosed sooner? Even, even the people with Williams syndrome didn't understand the challenges that you went through when you were on the cutting edge of a diagnosis that they were just starting to learn about. But for Michelle to have been diagnosed at three and a half was incredibly early at that time because most children weren't diagnosed until they were adults by that, by that time frame because they were dying. They weren't getting diagnosed. You right. know, and so, the school systems... The I just school want to point systems. out to the, the audience that this is frustrating. This is frustrating to a parent, that you know something's not right, and to get anyone to listen to you is frustrating. But they tend to blame oh, the mother. Goodness. And um, I could just... Uh, recommend that if a pediatrician doesn't listen to you and you have concerns about your child, go to another pediatrician. Don't be worried about insulting them. You have to do what's best for you and your child. That's what I did with, yeah. with my son. I went to a different pediatrician. Um, and and oh, go ahead, Marjorie. I was just going to say, and back then the school systems. They just looked at these children as lazy because they came in, they were avid readers, they were smart in certain things, and, oh, yeah, they just don't want to do math. Oh, yeah, they just don't want to uh, take the time to on their test to get a good score. So, you know, I, I mean, back then, so the school systems were just as bad. Yes. Yes, and uh, it was my experience with my son, who is on the autistic spectrum, that they will not tell you about any private schools or anything that will cost your town, your school district, money. This is something that you have to do research on your own, like I had to do, like you had to do, because no one's going to tell you. And I'm telling you folks um, out there listening, knowledge is power. You have to be an advocate. I say this all the time for caregivers. But when you have a special needs child, you are a caregiver, you have to be an advocate for that child because if you aren't, they're not going to get what they need. And it's up to the parent or guardian, whoever's 
in charge of that child to be an advocate. It's it's like, you know, yeah, I guess you do have a choice. If you don't advocate, um, be an advocate, your child is not going to get what, they're, what they need. You have to be an advocate to make sure your child gets what they need, and it's not easy. It's a struggle, and, and I know that it's a struggle because I had to deal with it myself um, with the child study team, not telling, you know, information, and this is why support groups are so important. Did you go yes. to a support group, Marge? <laughs> I, well, William Syndrome had a support group, but none of them dealt with what I was going through. And so I still felt all alone in, in this, you know, when the William Syndrome mothers, they all talked about how wonderful their child was and this and that. And, and when Michelle was little, my fight was with the doctors and the school system. But as Michelle grew, my fight became with her, with, you know, and, and that's why I, I, after I wrote her book, Another Day, Another Challenge, it was a couple of years later and I thought, oh, Lord, it couldn't have been that bad. Let me sit down and read this now. I sat down and read the book and oh, I thought, oh, my gosh, my head was spinning when I got done. It was like I went from one situation to another, to another, to another, you know? And it, it, even today, I thought, oh my gosh, am I going to make it home in time for this interview? Because Michelle <laughs> had an allergic reaction and I ended up, I ended up calling, we ended up calling 911 and getting her to the hospital because she had a severe allergic reaction to something. And so, even now as an adult, it's, you know, it's, she's very time consuming. <laughs> yeah, it's, um, it's a challenge, you know, being a parent guardian of an adult uh, child who has a disability. Um, you know, we think, I know I do, especially now that I'm getting older. I, I do have power of attorney uh, for Josh, but, you know, who's going to take care of Josh? Who's going to look after him? Uh, when when I die, I mean this is a fact, and um, you know it, it's hard for people want to take on that responsibility. Do you think about yeah. that, Marge? Of what is going to yes. happen to Michelle? Because I know we I do. Have, we have we have thought about it. We did a living. We did a trust for her, so that. Anything that we have, we can put her in and, and leave her some money that's not considered an income, but finding somebody willing to take her is a challenge because, yes. you know, her. I know that her brother and sister don't want to be straddled with the responsibility. And so, and I can't fault them there. You know, but even then, her brother and sister both read the biography and said, oh, my gosh, Mom, we didn't realize you went through all this with Michelle. And so, you know, so even though you've got other people there, they don't always know. They don't always understand. And, true. you yeah, know, that, that's so. very true. That's very true. Uh, when I wanted to take uh, Josh to a neurologist, uh, my father said, oh, you're looking for trouble, Betsy. And I said, no, trouble found me. Um, I have to, to go. And I knew, and I would tell the pediatrician, you know, Josh is behind. And, of course, the pediatrician blamed me or, you know, blamed Josh. Oh, he's lazy. He's just lazy. And I, I had to tell the audience, and this is what I highly recommend. You have to go with your gut instinct. If you think there's something that isn't right with your child, you know, follow that gut instinct, go to a different doctor, and keep going until you get peace of mind. A good pediatrician will take the time to listen to you, and they should not be blaming you that child could have a neurological problem. And that was the case with, with my son, who's the same age as Michelle, only a few months older. And, yeah. you know, it's frustrating. It, it is frustrating. 
and I want people to, you know, to realize this, uh, Marjorie, and they shouldn't judge because right away we get judged by the doctors and by um, our families, by, um, you know, even where you go places of worship. Um, people judge. Yes. You know, why can't they do that? Oh, or, yes. You know, it's, it's very... Yes. It's very painful. Floyd's brother, Floyd's brother, um, he told us Michelle was little at that time and wasn't even a problem. She just was developmentally delayed at that point. She was like six or seven years old, and Floyd's brother said, when you get tired of dealing with this, and he motioned towards Michelle, send her to me. I'll straighten her up in a hurry. That was Floyd's brother, you know, and so... And so, yeah, there there are people that just don't understand. Um, his older brother, this was a different brother, who who found out that I wrote the uh, Michelle's biography when the first edition came out. He said to Floyd, he said, oh, he said, now you're going to be wealthy. Floyd said, are you going to buy a book? He said, no, then I won't be wealthy. Well, something prompted him to go buy that book. He lives in Colorado. Something prompted him to go buy the book. So he went and bought the book, and he read it. And after he read it, after he read what we've gone through with Michelle, He went and bought another copy to give to his doctor and said, read this. You need to know about this. Wow. You know, and so, yeah. um, That's great. um, You get it. You get it from the doctors. You get it from the schools. You, you. It doesn't matter. You. They just. They don't know. They don't understand. They don't listen. You talked about places of worship. When Michelle was twelve, we had her reevaluated through CCDD, and um, I took the evaluation and I gave it to. Uh, to the youth pastor at our church, the children's pastor, because I I figured they need to know. Michelle's 12 years old. They're wanting her to go into the teen group, but she I discovered that she matured six months for every year she aged chronologically, which means that at 12 years old, she was only functioning and thinking on about a six-year-old level until she reached her develop, her peak developmental age. But I gave him that report, and I said, here, I think you ought to read this. And he said, okay. So he took it home and read it. The next time I, at church I saw him, he didn't mention it. So I asked him, did you read that report I gave you? His response was this. He said, yes. I read it. I understood it. I couldn't disagree with it more. These people don't know Michelle. Because people could see Michelle's intelligence, which was which was a manifest or characteristic of the Williams syndrome, but they couldn't see her learning disability. And so, and that's what I, I was at a Williams syndrome function one day, and I, I mentioned that. I said, people can't see past their intelligence to their learning disability. And boy, I, I had people, mothers with uh, children with Williams syndrome that turned around and said, that's exactly right. Our family thinks this, our family thinks that. Oh, you baby them, you this, you that, you the other because they cannot see what's really going on, and they don't want to listen. Why would they? They already know everything. Their child doesn't act that way. Yes, that is so true, uh, Marjorie. I had um, with, um, with Josh, he was delayed, so he wasn't potty trained until he was four. But once he got it, he Michelle got it. Michelle, too. And my dad said to me, because my, my older brother, um, he had issues, but, you know, back then they didn't diagnose. And my dad said to me, Betsy, your brother, you know, pooped and your mother put the diaper right in Bradley's face. And that cured him. That's what you should do for Josh. I said, uh, no, dad, that is child abuse. 
and uh, Josh has a neurological problem. And if you two ever do that, you'll never see Josh again. I could tell you that. Don't even think about it. Um, but, you know, that's the old way of, of thinking. And people just don't uh, understand. And especially, like in my son's case, Josh looks fine, but he has um, cognitive issues. He has trouble processing information. He doesn't like telling people he doesn't understand what they're saying. He's embarrassed to say that, and I encourage him to say it. But people just don't understand, and they are so quick to pass their judgments that, you know, anyone – I mean, let's face it, folks – I. Being a, a mom of someone who has special needs, dealing with Alzheimer's, anything can happen to anyone. In a spin of a dime, it can happen. Oh, my. Yes. Um, and so don't judge until you walked in our shoes. And as far as I'm concerned, I had a guest say, if you haven't walked in my shoes, then you're not fit to tie my shoelaces. Um, just people just... You know, my mother-in-law, she wanted me to force Josh to drink from a cup. Josh couldn't drink from a cup. He couldn't, he couldn't do it uh, at, that, at seven months old. He couldn't do it. And, you know, of course, every child does develop differently. But when they are delayed, significantly delayed, then it, it's time to get them, you know, checked. But why they always blame the mother, I, I cannot figure that out. Um, I can't. Oh, you don't make Josh move. You don't make Josh do this. I put his toys far away so he would walk. He was delayed in, you know, walking and crawling and sitting up, um, all that also. But it, it's yeah. just, um, your story. I'm so glad that I met you because your story, you know, touched my heart. We have a lot in common and I want people to know about, uh, our stories. I want to tell about your story and Michelle's. Uh, situation and learn about what people go through, what parents go through when their child is diagnosed. And, you know, you're fighting all sides, you know, family, doctors, child study team, and you trust, you trust these people to do the best by your child, and then you find out they're not. And it, it yeah. is difficult, you know, um, you become... Yeah strong, right? I mean, people say, oh, yeah, you're strong. Well, I had no choice. I had to be strong. <laughs> I, you know, you learn to develop a backbone, that's for sure. Um, Marjorie, is there anything um, else you'd like to, to say to the audience? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to have you back later on this year to discuss well, Michelle's adulthood. I, yeah. I, I did want to say that just like Josh, Michelle looks normal, she looks fine, and she can talk so intelligently. I remember on the phone one day she said, Mom, I'm so discombobulated. She uses big words and doesn't even know if you ask her, Michelle, what does discombobulated mean? I don't know, Mom, but I know that's what I'm like. You know, and my <laughs> son is looking that word up in the dictionary. He's like, Mom, I never heard that word. I thought Michelle made it up. Come to find out it's a real word, you know. And so I did want to say uh, for any of your viewers out there that are interested in looking for the book, this is the third edition. And so make sure you're not confused by the first one or the second one because, you know, the 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 first edition, I didn't realize how long um, – the court system lasts, and Michelle got into trouble with the law through something she did and uh, went to jail. And so, and that's where the first edition ends. So the the one you're looking for is a is the third edition. It's not on the cover, but if you see one that look inside the book, uh, you'll see it says third edition. Another day, another challenge. It is the complete story of, you know, right up, in fact, it's got a recent picture of her at age 37 in the book, her and her kitty cat. 
So And is this available on it's available on Amazon? It is. It's available on most at most major retail booksellers. Amazon, uh, Books and um, Barnes and Noble, and uh, Books a Million. So you know most where it, it's also available in paperback or in an ebook, Kindle oh. or the Note or whichever. You know, so people that might have have the e readers because they're on the go a lot, it is available in ebook. Oh great. Well I wanna thank you, Marjorie Street, for coming on, for writing your book, telling your story. The name of the book, folks, is The Biography of a Child with Williams Syndrome. Another day, another challenge. Please yeah. get the book um uh, and learn about this syndrome. And, you know, I just um, can't thank you enough. Uh, Chatting with Betsy is real stories, real conversations, unscripted, because I want people to be 100% themselves. And um, I just love doing what what, what I do. (laughs) And I want to thank you, Marjorie, for sharing your story. And uh, I'm definitely going to have to have you on again later this year to do part two of Michelle's adulthood. And folks, thanks for listening. If you missed any of this show, you could catch it wherever you hear your favorite podcast. I'm on CastBox, Spreaker, Spotify, to name just a few. It is free to subscribe. And I forgot to say this in the beginning, the views of the guests may not represent those of the host of the station. And I want to thank Jeannie White, the station manager at Passion World Talk Radio for writing a blog, producing the show. I want to thank Lauren Caldwell, CEO of Pastor World Talk Radio, for sending me the press release about Marjorie Streeb. And I'm so glad I interviewed you, Marjorie. Folks, in a world where you can be anything, please be kind, because you don't know what the battles are that people are facing. Please don't judge. Please be kind. That's true. We definitely would um, appreciate it. I think everybody would appreciate if everybody else was, was kind. We don't know what people are going through. So just um, offer a smile and um, just be, be kind. I can't say that enough. This is Betsy Wurzel, your host of Chatting with Betsy on Passionate World Talk Radio. Till we chat again, be safe, everyone. Bye-bye now. Are you looking for an Internet talk radio station for your podcast? Look no further. At the helm of Passionate World Talk Radio are two women that want to provide a spot for you and your podcast to be heard. There are many other places for your podcast, but PWTR has the audience. You will not be disappointed. Our station has been on the Internet for the past 16 years. Call us for more information, 484 484- Three six four one zero three two. Our text Jeannie White, station manager at T H E C O N N E C T S H O W at gmail dot com for our podcast show details. Thank you for listening to Passionate World Talk Radio. You can listen to this program all over again by going over to https colon forward slash forward slash passionate world talk radio dot com. You can also hear it on Spotify, Spreaker, Amazon A L E X A, AMFM two four seven dot com every Tuesday evening between eight and nine PM. YouTube Facebook, Facebook Live, LinkedIn, and all the other podcast directories one can find on the Internet.